Welcome to Beyond the Boardroom with Ben Bobo, a well-known entrepreneur and trailblazer who has led startup organizations for more than 15 years. Beyond the Boardroom is the only streaming video show in Orange County that interviews thought leaders from all different industries and cultures about life lessons they wish they'd learned earlier in life, covering topics that weave together the fabric of life and career, bringing you recipes for success, shared pearls of wisdom, and key life lessons for business and personal growth. Now here is your host, Ben Bobo. I'm talking to you from California with a very special guest, Dr. John Chen. Dr. Chen is a leading neurologist in Southern California. John, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Great Thank to you. have you today. Uh, great to be here. You know, uh, as a neurologist, you really deal with some very, very challenging patients, right? They have dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, migraines, a lot of different challenges, right? That exactly. Make up their experience in life. Exactly. Um, and as I think about what you have done with your career and how you ended up as a neurologist, I want to start sort of from the beginning because a lot of people could look at you and say, well, gee, John, he has a smart gene. Um, he's a doctor. Of course, it's easy for him. And of course, the journey is a little different for you maybe than other people. Um, but as we kind of go back in your experience, what would you say were the one or two biggest hurdles that you faced and how did you overcome them? Well, I think one of the big motivating factors for me becoming a doctor has to be my parents, specifically my mom. When I was five years old, she was told that she was going to die. And she was going to die in some awful manner from a disease that no one knew anything about. So my dad at that point didn't have a job. He just recently immigrated here to the United States. He was desperately trying to find some place to save my mom. Mm. So he ended up interviewing with uh, Ford Motor Company. And Ford at that point owned Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Detroit yeah. And the recruiter there says, don't worry, don't worry, Mr. Chen. They have the best doctors there. They're going to help your wife. My mom well, my dad was skeptical, right, because we've been to all sorts of other doctors and hospitals. They weren't able to help her. So he signed on the dotted line, and off we went. Now, we had just immigrated to the United States, so uh, this was a new environment for us. So we started out in Detroit, and I remember my mom being in the hospital, these doctors all standing around her. One of the surgeons came up to her and said, you know, your mom is going to be probably, he was saying, 60% chance of dying, 40% chance of living, and plan accordingly. And you were five years old. I was five years old at that point. So I went home and I cried. Mm. And my dad came in and he said, John, you got one day to cry over this and afterwards you're going to learn how to cook. You're going to learn how to clean. You're going to learn how to walk to school by yourself and walk back. You got to prepare for when your mom is not around. So that was the primary motive factor. I'm looking so wait at a people. second, you're five years old, and that is heavy, heavy, heavy advice from your father. What went through your mind as a five-year-old when your dad spoke into your life? I, you know, we had no one really around us at that point in time, just him and, and I. Mm. He had to work uh, nine to five. Uh, I was a latchkey kid at that point in time. We had some neighbors that helped out, but what, impressed me to this day was that the doctors were very frank about her survival saying we have 40 percent yes but we have 60 percent no yeah. so she got the operation she stayed in the hospital for six months you know we visited her maybe once every week or so and slowly I can see her get better slowly the doctors and this is the thing more and more doctors came into the room until the day before she gets discharged, we were sitting there in a, in a huge auditorium. There are hundreds of doctors, residents, nurses there, and they're applauding because she survived something that was probably not going to be survivable. So I knew at that point that, you know, whatever these people did, they saved my mom. So I got to go back and see what I can do to, to, to help. I mean, that's got to be a profound impact. Now, your mom was in the hospital for how? What, About what six time? months. Six months. Right. And when she came home, there was a long recovery uh, period of time. Uh, she trained as a horticulturalist in Taiwan. But, you know, horticulturalist in, in Detroit, I don't think there's much need for that. So in order to sort of try to thank the community, she started working in the Dearborn, Detroit area. And uh, she started working as a, a bank teller because she didn't want to stay at home. Um, and slowly in the next 20 years, she worked herself from being a bank teller to the vice president. 
Wow. So, so that's inspirational. Yeah, inspirational hard work through through all those years. So you, you had this challenge. Was the was the answers obvious uh, through that period of six months or year? Because you know the biggest challenge we have in life is when we get hit with uncertainty. Uncertainty is one of the biggest stressors. So exactly. what was it that allowed you to get through that period of time, especially at five, five and a half? It was taking one small step at a time. There was a goal at the end, which is her getting healthy. Right. right. There was a goal in my dad's life, my life. And it, you take those tiny little steps and you chain them together until you finally reach to the end, whatever that end may be, either health, your personal goals. So I took a lot of direction from that early on was this perseverance, right. this, you know, I guess the term is now grit, grit. of moving forward right. uh, with tiny steps and then moving forward to the direction that you want to go. Wow. So that was, well, I would say, one of the biggest motivating factors starting at that young age. I mean, that's impressionable, right? right? It's your mom's in the balance. You got doctors that exactly. had the solution, worked her through the problem, that forever left that impression uh, in your mind. So tell the audience, how did you get started? I mean, here you are now a neurologist. Uh, we understand the sort of the force behind your decision making, but where did it all start for you? Um, it started with most likely, I would think, in junior high to high school. You're sort of trying to decide what was the interesting topics that you want to invest your time with. And remember uh, in biology class, oh, this is pretty interesting because up to this point, none of my, uh, my extended family were, were physicians. They're all engineers, uh, ex-military and what have you. And uh, if I was going to be interested in the biologic field, it would be the first one. So I'm going there. I'm asking my, uh, my biology teacher, hey, I'd like to be a doctor. I think you know, doctors are great. They help me. And, and she said to me, well, you know it's going to be really hard. Um, um, I don't know if you could actually you know, do it. So at that point, I said, wait a second. Here's <laughs> someone telling me that I can't actually get to that goal. So you know what? I'm going to put my head to it. I'm going to see how far I can go with this. So the next four years, we pushed, uh, you know, we pushed pretty hard with all the academic studies. And so I ended up going to the University of Michigan uh, Medical School through a program that involved both undergraduate and graduate training. Both. So let me, let me stop you right there. That, right. That's, that's a profound thing you just said, right? <laughs> Here you are, impressionable. You went through this period of time with your mother. You saw what the doctors did. Now you have a teacher who's, you know, teachers are supposed to be the ones that speak into your life and encourage you. And in a way she did, but in a negative sense, it motivated you for four years in, in, in high school to really get focused. I think it's probably reverse psychology, is that if you had someone say, oh yeah, you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it, well, maybe you slack off. But if you had someone say, well, you know what? The deck's stacked against you. You got a long trip ahead. I love it. You gotta work for this if you really want it. So, you know, it's that apple that's hanging right in front right. of you. You want to pluck that apple, but someone keeps on moving those chains in front of you. So you're going after that. You're going after that. So I think that was... Uh, her way of motivating exactly. you. Exactly. I have psychology. to thank her for that. Yes. Because it was, well, it was a gift. It was a gift. It was definitely a gift. So you end up at the University of Michigan, and what compelled you to ultimately become a neurologist? Well, I had great mentors over there. I had research mentors. I had clinical mentors. And we had an opportunity to experience a lot of different fields out there in medicine and other um, uh, fields, uh, psychology, political science. And it was ultimately the attraction to neurology was uh, Norman Foster, a uh, neurologist over there at uh, University of Michigan, excellent uh, dementia physician. And his demeanor, his intelligence, his respect was something that attracted me to that entire field. Plus. Back then, I, had get, I got to work with some really high-tech stuff, like I'm sitting there with a, a PET scanner with a nuclear medicine kilometer spinning right behind me. Right. How many kids, yeah, 18 or 19, get to work like that? And there was MRI scanners around us. It was just coming down. We're going glass so all these bright objects started fo focusing your purpose, in, in essence, right? You got all these tools you can work with. It really intrigued you, and it started to feed into that narrative that you 
thought about neurology and how you could impact people. Right, exactly. And with that, with uh, Dr. Foster and later on with the excellent residents, the neurosurgeons, and other neurologists here who start formulating into how do I fit into um, this healthcare system? So that ultimately led me to the UCLA over here in Westwood, which had a- So you, you graduated from University of Michigan as a neurologist or medical school, and then you did your residence at UCLA, or how did that play right. out? Medical school at University of Michigan, okay. and we selected what do we wanted to do. I selected neurology, and I matched into UCLA in Westwood. So, uh, you know. And UCLA is one of the top neurological programs in the country, if not the world. Well, uh, I believe so. It's, yeah. a, it's an excellent uh, place. Uh, back then, it was before, uh, the uh, Ronald Reagan facility was built, so we had the old main, uh, um, but it was the people that attracted me to that facility. And to this day, um, I still uh, you know, collaborate with them, I still talk to them. Uh, it is the people at UCLA that um, uh, built those early foundations of being a, a clinician and neurologist. So when I ask you these questions, what I notice, you have this twinkle in your eye, a constant smile on your face, was there any challenge at University of Michigan or UCLA in your journey, or was was it like a kid in a playground where I'm in a candy store and this just comes natural? Well, okay. well the, the biggest challenge was when you get to these excellent centers of learning, you realize that if you thought you were smart, you probably weren't <laughs> that smart. And I realized part of that grit has to come in. You know, I have, there are people there that can memorize like a book from beginning to end. And photographic going, memory. Oh, uh, wow, that's uh, fantastic. So I can't do that at all. So, so um, you went from exceptional in high school, exceptional University of Michigan, maybe, maybe not so exceptional compared to others, and then you went to UCLA, and it's that old pyramid. Right, exactly. So as you go further up, you realize that there are so many talented individuals uh, who are there at these uh, places, and you learn from them also. The colleagues that uh, I went through residency and fellowship were now, now holding great academic positions, uh, great private positions, and um, I still uh, talk to them. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity. The twinkle in my eye is you, you get to know all these people from a personal level, and uh, to see their accomplishments, and to know them personally, it's like, wow, I had the opportunity to work with them. That, that was absolutely fantastic. So that's the twinkle in my eye, is I'm thinking about all the achievements, how great that, you know, uh, their careers are uh, and right. all that. Right. You know, beyond the boardroom, it's all about a board of directors, as we said earlier. And, you know, when you think about your life, you have a board of directors. You have those people that have influenced you on scene and scene in your life. And so as you think back on those people on your personal board, who is that one person that stands out that said, man, with this person, it changed the course of my career, of my life? It's got to be my wife. It has to be my wife. Um, I fell in love with her the first day I, I saw her back in uh, 1997. And, and you guys met in? We met here in Southern California. Okay. She had actually just started her job down the street at Edwards Life Sciences. Sure. It was Baxter back then, yeah. uh, before the Edwards days. Right. And she had just started in that first week. I had also just started at UCLA, and it was by a chance happening that we met together at my cousin's uh, house in Buena Park. So uh, stop a second. That, this is really interesting, right? You just went through this whole history of your mom and her illness and what motivated you. You go through medical school, University of Michigan. You're about to go into UCLA, and you say that the biggest influence in your life is your wife. That is awesome. So go into why that was. She is a honest, straightforward, practical, pragmatic person who has such a depth of, of integrity and strength. There are challenges that we went through in the past 15 to 20 years that we continue to go through that if it weren't for her steadfastness, steadfastness in, in, right. in uh, her personality, her demeanor. I mean, uh, part of the reason I'm here today, Ben, is because of her strength with, uh, with everything that we have accomplished and have gone through with, with everything. So right. that I have to, she plays a very prominent role in my life. You know, it's funny, in a lot of cultures around the country, certainly in Orange County, 
uh, we're guilty of it. Um, people buy into the philosophy that having good, looking good, and feeling good, and having the goods is the good life. But really what you're saying, the good life is built on relationships, authenticity, character. And that, what's, what's interesting is you accomplish all this as a doctor, and you're really impacting a lot of lives, but what you pivot back to is, it's not my facade, it's not my MD degree, it's that person that was brought into your world that's made the biggest impact based on those values. Exactly. How can I go out and help other people if I don't have the strong support at home? That's right. probably the take home point I wanna wow. emphasize right here, is that uh, it is the support, my mother, my wife, this is where uh, the foundations were built. And then uh, from that standpoint, move forward with uh, you know, everything else that, uh, that uh, we're doing now. That's awesome, and, and thanks for sharing that. Uh, I've known you a little while, and I've known right. a little bit about your story, and uh, what you shared was profound. I didn't know that about your mother, but thanks for sharing. Um, as we head into the break, I, one question I want to come back at after the break is one of the, my pet peeves is in life, there's things I could have known 10 to 15 years ago. Had I known that, I could have been that much further ahead and that much more effective and that much more successful. And I'm sure the audience can really relate to that. So as we, we come, come into the break, uh, think about one or two things, recipes for success, had you known earlier in your career, how it would it have made a difference to where you're at today? Okay. 35 million people in America suffer from migraine headaches once or twice a month. Historically, migraines have been diagnosed and treated subjectively with a hit and miss rate of success. Serenitex is leading the effort in precision migraine screening that gives you an objective diagnosis and guide to treatment. Do you suffer from tension headaches or chronic migraines? Could you benefit from the right medication for relief and get your life back to health? If so, then come volunteer to be part of this groundbreaking research study on migraine diagnostics. To participate, contact serenitex.com or call 949-538-5600, extension 107. Welcome back to Beyond the Boardroom Show. We're here with Dr. John Chen. And the last segment we were asking the question, one of my pet peeves is things we would have known 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if we had known it then, how we could have been much more effective. There's just certain recipes for success. People have a lot of wisdom. They've lived life. And sometimes, honestly, people don't share everything with you on purpose, right? There's just certain things they won't share. Um, but what we want to do in this show is really try to delve into successful people's lives and hear their words of wisdom. So. Uh, John, in, in terms of your experience, what is one or two recipes for success that were shared to you that you look back and said, man, if I'd have known that sooner, it could have made a world of difference. Well, Ben, the obvious thing is, number one, listen to your wife more. That's the number <laughs> one thing. I wish I would have listened to her more in retrospect on many things in my life. But beyond that, what I'm looking at after these past 10, 15, 20 years of practice is communication. And what I mean by communication, I mean by uh, uh, typing in and, and basically uh, writing in such a fashion that you can express complex ideas to a wide uh, audience. It, it doesn't need to be patience. It, it, it does have to be to the general you know, public that you're, you're serving. Right. And I think if I knew that from 10, 15 years ago, I think I could have been a lot more effective than what I am now. If I just had that keen eye, as that how can I present these ideas that are really important to a lot of people? So, uh, looking back, that's the one thing that I wish I probably would have gone forth and invested a little more time and energy in into properly uh, how to type, how to communicate, how to write, and uh, and how to move forward with then uh, uh, that public realm. You know, that's a very important point because right. a lot of times when we communicate, we get presentations or speeches or whatnot, we'll communicate something, it'll go to the neurocortex, a higher level reasoning thinking, and how the person picks it up isn't necessarily how we intended it or what we were thinking. Sometimes you have to go to the croc brain or the lizard brain and keep it really, really simple. And you're talking about in your, in your practice, in your life, you're dealing with people that are very sick, that are very stressed, that are very scared, a lot of uncertainty in their world. And yet you gotta be able to take these very complex notions, break it down into bite-sized morsels that they can actually practically use as they go home and try to manage that disease state. Precisely, and I think that's an important lesson for any individual, any practitioner, is to understand the impact of that information, the impact of, 
uh, what you've learned over all the years and how to communicate that in the most effective uh, manner uh, so patients, family, uh, the general public can make the best decisions about their own lives and their own health. And that's a very important message that um, I think if, uh, if anyone's in training or interested in healthcare, uh, that's something that, that is a skill that can be mastered over time. So transition, what are some pearls of wisdom you'd give people going into college, coming out of college, maybe they're in their 30s and they're in an inflection point in their career or, or they're frustrated. Are there some pearls you could offer the audience as to how to get breakthroughs or how to think about things differently? Well, it goes back to the very beginning, how I became who I was, those tiny little steps. So you break it down to that absolutely first step that everyone faces. And I think this is all through the internet already. I think uh, there's some good speakers, even a book on it, is the number one concept is make your bed. Yes. I emphasize that to my children. I, I speak about that with my patients. Admiral McRaven, I believe. Precisely, yes. Commandant Marine Corps, is that yes. correct? Right, so. so the well, actually, the Navy. I Navy? Think. Okay. Yeah, right. He's a Navy SEAL. Apologize, yeah. Navy yeah. SEAL, not, not Marine Corps. Uh, but that simple concept of having that structure and that order, that beginning, so no matter what challenges, no matter what issues were felt during that time period during the day, you come home, you have a bed that's already made. And that's that first step that you make in that day is you accomplish something right out the bat, right? So you open up your day with something that you're accomplished. So that's your tiny baby step. And then you can build on that throughout the day. Exactly. Yeah. The second concept is learn from your failures. You know, no one gets to where they are without having failure. Now, failure is you know, an option, and that's what happened. But one has to learn to see why that happened, and you have to learn from that and move forward from that. I've had many failures in my life, and if I did not correct the failures, I would still be doing the same thing. Right. You know, the funny thing about life is we talk about failures or choices we made, mistakes that were made, and in reality, most of us like to manage our emotional states to happy levels, right? And you think about it, um, we don't want to go for the hard things in life necessarily or those lessons we've learned. We wouldn't sign up for it naturally. But in reality, when you go through those difficult times or those setbacks and challenges, that's what develops that muscle, that determination, right? The that grit, grit right. that you talked right, about. Right. Yeah. So obviously that's a very, very big component to learn is to learn from, from uh, the failures that we had. And the final concept that is important is uh, controlling your environment, controlling the world around you. And I, I don't mean in an egotistical way. I mean, here you are in a situation that it may not be where you would want to be, either professionally, personally, uh, where you live physically. Well, you have the power. You have the power to go forward and change that environment. There's nothing that prevents you from doing that. It is frightening, it is scary, but the, it is better than staying in the same rut. And again, baby steps, knowing where you're, you know, learning from your failures, and then finally changing that environment to an environment that is to your benefit, to your liking. And that could go with anything, personally, academically, uh, whatever job that you may want. Uh, that, I think, are the three things that have guided my life in the past, you know, 20, 30 well, years. Well, that's powerful, that last one, change your environment, meaning being intentional, being aware, being alive and alert, and not just going like a zombie, accepting the status quo, but always analyzing, checking, you know, plan, do, act, check, to make sure that your environment is in line with your value system, where you want to go, and that the people you surround you, your board of directors, Right. Uh, encompass right. that. Right, right. It is a challenging environment. The environment is changing around us uh, minute by minute almost. And with technology, uh, with the communication, uh, this is something that we should all be very mindful about, uh, you know, controlling and, and changing the environment. Absolutely. Let's pivot a little bit. Let's uh, talk about something that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. Something that's true, that you believe is true, that almost nobody agrees with you on. Uh, 
the future is always going to be better. You have to hold on to that. I know um, there are challenges ahead, and um, in this day and age, there are many, many challenges in um, science, in personal lives, in politics, but the future is going to be that golden apple that we're going to have to hold in front of us because that will be the change in, uh, that will be something that we can all look forward to and work toward. That is awesome. Yeah. So if, is there anything uh, you'd like to share with the audience that we have not covered? Well, um, the road is convoluted. Uh, it is definitely a road that is uh, unique to all of us. And no matter what you're, where you are right now, if there are things that are not in your favor, guess what? That's going to change. Oh. You're going to have a situation in time that that will be better. So you're never going to give up on that. You're going to change your environment there. You're going to take those steps. You're going to move forward in the direction that you want to be. And you got to look into the future for that. Right? So the past is the past. The future is where you're, you're going to have to concentrate your efforts on. Right. And that's the message I would like to That's to great. Give. John, where can, they, where can the audience find out more about you? Um, you can visit uh, my website. I am a practicing neurologist in Orange County. Um, it's www.eneuroc.com. It's going to be available at the end of uh, this video. Um, I'm also there in, in uh, LinkedIn, as well as there is a Facebook presence for our uh, company. Um, I'm also on Instagram, uh, too. Um, or you can find me in the uh, middle part of Orange County um, on a staff and the medical stroke director of uh, four facilities in Orange County, uh, Orange County Global Medical Center, Anaheim Global Medical Center, Chapman Medical Center, Chapman Global Medical Center, and South Coast. Uh, medical center as well as uh, uh, Health South Test and Rehabilitation Hospital. And my clinic is over there in the city of Orange also. And um, uh, you can Google me. Uh, I'm I think I'm also on Yelp too. Great. John, thanks so much for being today's guest. Th thank you for inviting me. Really enjoyed me. the conversation. Likewise. That's it from Beyond the Boardroom. I'm Ben Bobo. You can learn more about today's guest, John, on our Facebook page at Beyond the Boardroom Show. And remember, Becoming is better than being. When we founded Stradling in 1975, we made a commitment to helping our clients to succeed and create opportunities for business growth throughout California and beyond. Our people share cutting edge focus in guiding the critical transactions and disputes of our clients. And we've developed a deep bench of contacts and resources to get the job done as trusted advisors to technology, life science, software, and medical device companies. We've invested in building our expertise, developing the best of legal talent, and the readiness to serve the business community. From our commitment to our clients, to our deep involvement in the communities we serve, we understand our job is your success. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Beyond the Boardroom. We look forward to bringing you more thought-provoking episodes again real soon and look forward to your feedback and remarks. If you have any particular topic or person you would like to have us cover or interview, please reach out to us at ben at beyondbobo.com. Till next time, may you continue to map your own path to success.